Hello, I'm Andrew Pearce. This is The Daily Show from The Daily Mail Newsroom. Coming up, it's leap year on Saturday, so women can propose. But will they? Sewing on buttons. Apparently, if we sewed on more buttons, it would save hundreds of thousands of clothes being dumped on rubbish tips. The oldest human being in history. She was French and famous. Apparently, it might have been a hoax. Is the government going to allow acid wash chicken into Britain as part of a trade deal with the United States? Their Lordship's house, they're claiming lots of money and expenses and not doing the work. I'm going to be talking to Geoffrey Archer about what we should do next. But the coronavirus, thousands of people in Italy have been locked down as hundreds of uh, many towns are locked down in the north of Italy. Now, the coronavirus scare sparked a snap travel freeze between Austria and Italy tonight. Officials in Vienna scrambled to block the infection, breaching the border. Ministers in Rome are fi firefighting a spike in the number of cases, and they've taken drastic action to contain the spread of the out outbreak. Venice's flagship carnival celebrations were cut short. Other events have been postponed altogether. Joining me now is Christian Boomer, who's politics journalist at the Courier newspaper in Vienna. Christian, the border has been closed with Italy. When was the last time that happened? Uh, hi. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but the border has not been closed to, oh. to Austria. That is, that is um, there, there are a couple of parties here who want to close the I border. I see. But the, the health minister, Rudy Anschubert, said that we have to be alert, but there is no need for panic here. Do so, so we, yeah, that's, but that's are, for that. But are people going to panic? Are people panicking? Um, well, it, it really depends. I mean, um, um, we have, here in Austria, we have had 190 tests so far. And there, were, there has been no single one uh, who's, who's been positive. And what the, the officials over here say is, um, especially the health minister, is we have arrived now in Austria, which is, as you know, a very small country, yeah. 140,000 people who are infected with the regular flu. And every year uh, around 1,000 Austrians die from the regular flu. So he, he tries to keep the perspective. He says we have no infected people over here. We are really alert because the... the um, the officials in Italy are really alert and they're not panicking, but they're they're taking this this uh, thing serious. But so far, you know, over here, no nobody has died, no one is infected, so that's that. Is there a sense, Christian, that people in Austria think perhaps in other countries people are overreacting? Um, maybe you could say that. So, um, what I can say here is, um, we have, uh, you know, we, we don't really know what's happening in China. So what we do here is uh, we have a direct, uh, you know, from Vienna to, to Beijing. It's a, uh, it's a very common flight. So we have uh, very restricted controls from people coming in from there. But what, what are you going to do? You cannot, you know, you cannot control every human being who is traveling in the European Union to Austria. Um, and we have very, that's what we know here. We have a very good healthcare system. So people are not really afraid uh, of that. But, you know, the people in Italy, I don't know what's what's driving them crazy right now. Um, there are a lot of Austrian people from Corinthia, that's uh, a region in the south, who are traveling uh, to, to, to Italy, northern Italy, because that's what it sees, that where Venice is and, and stuff like that. And now they're really getting, uh, you know, annoyed by, by Italian people saying, wow, it's so dangerous and stuff like that. So you could say that over here in Austria and Vienna especially, we're taking it serious, but people are not afraid, really. I mean, they're joking about it. Uh, if you go into a supermarket and somebody's, you know, having a cough or is sneezing, mm -hmm. uh, you would tell, oh, uh, it's dangerous, could be coronavirus. But it's not that, that people are really trying to get food and stuff and, and, and really panicking, no. That's All right. Not. All right. That's Christian Boomer, who is a politics journalist at the Courier newspaper in Vienna. Uh, now, remember to tell your Alexa speaker to play Daily Mail News. You'll get the latest newsroom live from Mail Plus. And at five, you hear the latest Daily Show. The House of Lords is in the firing line again after the revelation that expenses for members of the House of Lords soared by one third to £23 million last year. 100 of their lordships never spoke once or asked a question in the entire year, but still managed to claim between them £1 million in tax-free attendance allowance. Joining me now is one of the more celebrated members of the House of Lords, Lord Archer of Western Supermare, obviously better known as Geoffrey Archer, the best-selling novelist. Lord Archer, um, those figures look pretty bad when you consider there are 800 peers in the House of Lords, making it the second biggest elected assembly in the world after the Chinese People's Republic. 
Yes, and it is too big. I think the Lords ought to be about 450 to 500. And there are, as you have rightly pointed out, Andrew, those who take advantage of the system. They pop in, get their 300 pounds and go home, and they, as you pointed out, don't bother with making speeches and don't bother with taking part, i.e. voting or doing anything else. But one must weigh against that, that there are several members of the Lordship's House that work very hard indeed, and they scrutinize bills that have gone through the House of Commons too quickly, line by line, clause by clause, before they send it back as far better legislation. And they rarely get any praise because the few, the handful who take advantage of the system can get headlines. When, and when you say, Lord Archer, they pop in so they can claim their attendance hours, do you mean literally that they just they just stick around for 10 or 15 minutes, then they can uh, claim their uh, daily attendance hours, which, by the way, is going up to £323 in April? Yes, which is considerably cheaper than uh, Germany, France or Italy's second chamber, considerably cheaper. But what you're quite rightly getting at is the handful of people who disabuse the system. Our second chamber is actually rather cheap. But when you hear someone has made £79,000 and not bothered to speak and not bothered to vote, they quite rightly should be angry. And those sort of people uh, shouldn't be in the House of Lords. And when we actually, if we go, if, as the Prime Minister suggests, we go to York, I think there's a bigger story, Andrew. I think the bigger story is is if we go to York, which I have nothing against, what a great city, if you put the House of Lords in York, they'll all pop up there on their trains first class. They'll all rent flats and live up there. And some of the most able people in this country, great scientists who are working often during the day, great lawyers, great educationalists, great businessmen and women who are working during the day, they're not going to be popping up to York. They're not going to be offering their wisdom after years of experience. So the system will get even worse if we move. And what about you personally, Lord Archer? You are, I know, approaching a big birthday this year. Um, I think it's the big 8-0. Uh, will, will you, do you have any plans to retire? Well, I think the honourable thing to do, as Shirley Williams made very clear when she did her resignation, is that when you reach 80, you should see out that parliament and go. You shouldn't go beyond there. And in my particular case, I, I very rarely speak and don't vote and, uh, and don't claim any expenses for that reason. So I think the honourable thing is to make the numbers less. And so there should be a group of us who, uh, having served our time, should go. But they also, to be fair, uh, those people who are uh, making a bit on the side, you're not going to get rid of them that way. No, because it's, um, it's money for old rope, if you don't mind me saying so. Well, yes, it is. But the sad thing, I repeat, Andrew, is it undermines those lords who are doing a very, very capable job. All right, that's Lord Archer of Western Supermare. You've heard it here first. He's retiring when he's 80. Now, if you enjoy The Daily Show, please subscribe to us, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google or Spotify, and get in touch by emailing me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or follow us at mailplus. Now, the Environment Secretary, George Eustace, has refused to categorically rule out chlorine-washed chicken being imported into the UK under a Brexit trade deal with the United States. He declined to give a cast-iron commitment on the issue, as he suggested the chlorine washing method had largely been replaced by what he said were lactic acid washes. Ugh. Joining me now is Gareth Morgan, who's Head of Policy for Farming and Land Use at the Soil Association, the UK's leading organic food and farming charity. Gareth, um, the whole issue about the, the this chlorine and, and the, these methods, it's not about uh, so much about what we eat. Is it more to do with the welfare of the chicken? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's certainly not a very pleasant thought, some of the things that these chickens are being washed in. But what really um, we're concerned about is that after the washing of these chickens, this really allows the rearing of the chickens to be done in a way which it wouldn't be acceptable in the UK. And and that's what people should be worried about at the moment. What do you think, what what is likely to happen to these chickens? 
How are they going to be, uh, I was say brought up, that's the wrong word. Are they going to be like battery hens? Yes, I mean, ba battery rearing of chickens is very common. But yeah. um, in, in some countries, these chickens are reared in really, really close confined quarters. They're bred now to be to be to grow very quickly, so that they they they're, they're crammed into their their quarters. They're very prone to disease, and that's one of the reasons why these methods are used to clean them afterwards, because we know that they tend to be, can be very contaminated with bacteria. And at the end of the process, um, something like chlorine washing or lactic acid washing is used to take those bacteria out. What we'd like to see is chicken rearing done in a way that makes sure you don't have these diseases in the in place to start. And the UK has made good progress on this. Our big worry is that if we go down the route of bringing in chickens from countries which these techniques are allowed, our own chicken producers are going to going to say, well, we, we're going to have to produce our chickens in the same way to be able to compete. And that isn't the direction of travel we want. And at the moment, the, the, this, this type of chicken is banned in the European Union. Is that right? That's right. The, so, so the current standards don't allow it. Now, I think some of that started from concern about the chlorine itself but uh, since that i think that the focus has become much more on what what is it that this chlorine washing is allowing to happen in the rearing of the chickens where, where, where they're produced and that's what we don't want to start allowing will in the marketplace um will it be gareth that these chickens will be sold much more cheaply well the the, the, the chickens can be produced incredibly cheaply by this method but we have to think is that cheap production of chicken coming at a cost that we really shouldn't be allowing? Oh, and yeah. One yeah. of the problems is that, that um, customers, say, buying a chicken sandwich, they're not going to know how this chicken is reared. So that they, they might be paying a two or three pound sandwich for the chicken. They're not going to know whether that chicken has been chlorinated. It's not going to be on the label. And then, and then the thing is, it's, it's, it goes back to the old thing, doesn't it, about choice, Gareth, because um, you, you see your free range eggs in the supermarket and I see lots of people in Waitrose not buying free range eggs. And I think, why aren't you buying free range eggs? Because they, perhaps they can't afford them. People, middle class people will be able to buy the organic free range chicken. The poorer people are probably going to end up buying this American chicken. Yeah, and I don't, it's, it's really very unfair to think that um, we, we, we might open up the system to, to, to almost force pe people who can't afford these products to be buying inferior products from abroad. What we need to be doing is making sure that we're supporting British farmers to work to acceptable standards to produce um, chicken at a fair price that, that everyone can afford. And at the minute, chicken on the shelves in the UK is affordable. Uh, we'd like to see a continuing raising of those standards. What we don't want to see is moving in the opposite direction, particularly when people aren't going to be able to um, the stuff isn't going to be labelled and they don't know what they'll be buying. Indeed. That's Gareth Morgan. He's Head of Policy for Farming and Land Use at the Soil Association. Now, coming up, the oldest woman in history. Big story. Is it really a hoax? And I'm talking buttons to Princess Diana's wedding dress designer. But first, of course, I'm talking TV with Claudia Connell. Thanks, Andrew. Well, MasterChef is back on telly tonight on BBC One. You might be surprised to learn that MasterChef was ever not on telly, as it just seems to be constantly on. But the last one we saw was the celebrity version, and this is the non-celebrity version. So a new batch of hopefuls will be put through their culinary paces. And we've got, now wait for it, we've got 24 weeks of this instalment. That's half a year. So you better get used to old shouty Greg Wallace talking with his mouth full. There's also a new drama, Flesh and Blood, and that starts on ITV. There's something that I want to tell you all. I have met a new friend. Dad's only been gone a year. I don't like it. I just think he's got a really strange hold over her. It. Hope is stressful for you. The kids being so hard on you, feeling you're stealing their mum away. What about your private lives? Is it fair to say they're in some turmoil? Do you still love her? Francesca Annis plays Vivian, a wealthy widow, and she finds love again. Um, and it's a bit too soon after losing her husband for her children's liking. And that throws the family into chaos and it leads to tragedy. Amelda Staunton plays Mary, the wealthy widow's nosy curtain twitcher of a neighbour. She spies on the neighbours, she opens the mail, and she's really great. She actually really makes this programme. And finally, um, a few weeks ago, four people were convicted following the stabbing of Courtney Valentine Brown in South End in Essex, two for murder and two for manslaughter. Tonight, there's a new series on BBC Two called Murder 24-7. Three men armed with a pickaxe and a baseball bat. It looks like some sort of hatchback. I really thought the sailing was coming through. What a this bloke done that he deserved to die. Who are those men? It follows the work of Essex police who investigate the crime. So it starts with... 
uh, the days after the murder, and it goes right through to the arrest, the prosecution, and the conviction. I mean, we know this sort of program is not new. I mean, Channel 4 started it with their uh, 24 hours in police custody. But there is something really gripping about watching real detectives solve real crime. So, Claudia, thanks so much for that. Now, time for our regular city update with Ruth Sunderland, business editor at the Daily Mail. Well, we thought it would happen, and it has. The coronavirus has now infected the market, big time, I it, think. It, it really has. So, until now, the markets were remarkably calm. I mean, too calm, really. And now that has bitten with a vengeance. The markets have really taken on board the potential scale and scope of coronavirus. So, because they've woken up to the fear that it could be a pandemic so this has been sparked really by what's happening in Italy yeah. in South Korea and mm. beyond China they've really suddenly got spooked so the FTSE down very sharply today um, more than 62 billion pounds wiped off um, the Dow has just opened in America um, and already over 800 points off the Dow, you know, so, and this is being mirrored around the world. Mm. So not a good day to take your retirement fund. No. You know? did, um, did the same thing happen with the SARS? Can you, Ruth, was it that bad? Well, was, was there a knock on effect on the so markets? It, I mean, the markets were concerned about SARS. I, it, it is different now because um, back in the days of SARS, China just wasn't playing such a big mm, part course. in the world economy. So it, it's a very different scenario. So we've seen today companies like travel firms and tourism being hit because, you know, the concerns about people staying at home. But really it will go, could potentially go right across the board. If people are unable to get supplies, if people are, you know, even unable maybe to get into their offices and work or their factories and work in certain parts of the world, mm. that's obviously going to have an effect. Oxford Economics say if it turns into a global pandemic, it could be $1.1 trillion off the world economy. Now, I must just say before um, you give me the hook and, and haul me off, um, if you are investing in the stock market, always the same advice, don't panic yeah. over a day's fall. So yeah. don't rush, you know, stay calm. If you don't desperately need to get money out, don't rush to sell, you know, it may well be tomorrow people calm down and it goes back up again. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a long-term investment. Don't start rushing for the and door. And some people, of course, will go into the market and buy because the shares have fallen they, so much. They, they, w they will. Some people, and they are at the moment looking at buying opportunities, shares that have fallen, people think they've fallen too much. There are also some opportunities, no doubt, out there. The company that comes up with the the vaccine, the antidote, yes. is going to do really They're well. They're going to do very, very well. I hope we know who it is first. That's Ruth Sunderland. <laughs> now the Deputy Sports Editor, Matt Gatford, is back with a Welsh suntan. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Not a lot of sun. No. Uh, quite a lot of wind. A lot of rain. And a lot of rain, yes. Now, I have to be honest, I can't bear Tyson Fury, but my word, that was quite a turn up for the books, wasn't it? It was an incredible performance, yeah. I mean, not just the victory, but the manner of the victory. Yeah. It was never in doubt. Swaggering, I mean. Absolutely. From the word go, he just took the fight to Wilder. He said he would, but of course he says a lot of things. Mm. And uh, he contradicts himself and, uh, you know, we didn't think necessarily give his game plan away. But that's what he predicted. He said, I'll be on the front foot. I won't be dancing around the ring trying to get away from him I will own the centre of the ring and he did just that I caught I saw a bit of it when um, uh, he was wheeled into this into the ring uh, yeah. wearing a, a crown and, and, on, and his a, throne. on his throne I thought oh my god it is so naff yeah but he's an entertainer he you know? is. What the f and, and you know no matter what he said in the yeah. past and he has said some you know mm. some pretty despicable things he is an absolute entertainer it's very hard to take your eyes off him yeah. you know and then he sings to his wife um, oh, afterwards incredible. and he was singing American Pie and getting the crowd to sing along so you know he's a showman he's an entertainer yeah. and uh, he's now you know massive box office and he's now going to get paid pretty much what he wants for the next fight. And the legendary Jeff Powell writes in the Mail today, probably the finest uh, fight by yeah. a British boxer overseas yeah. ever. Yeah, best British, you know, there's always, you know, these rush to judge and compare yes. and eras are different and everything. But, you know, Jeff Powell's seen a lot of boxing. Certainly has. And he says it's the finest uh, performance, yeah, as you say, he's seen by Brit over overseas. I never watched any of it. Now, we did well at the rugby. We beat Ireland. We did. An amazing performance, actually, because, you know, th again, this was a tight one, a tough one to call. And there were some people who were predicting an Irish win. And, you know, it, Twickenham, England are very good at home. They, they, you know, it is rare that they 
they don't win. But even so, no one quite expected the manner of the performance. It was up there with the performance against the All Blacks in the World Cup semi-final, mm. especially the first half. They just battered Ireland. They were good in all departments, and all Eddie Jones's weird selections sort of paid off. So, uh, yeah, brilliant performance. Um, and there's an outside chance now, of course, that they could win the Six Nations Championship. They need France to slip up at some point, but, right. uh, but they're in the hunt. OK, and just finally, briefly, Matt, a new star for Manchester United. Yeah, Bruno Fernandes yesterday, as Man U beat Watford 3-0, he was very good, ran the centre of midfield, played like a kind of a number 10. Um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer even went as far afterwards to compare him to Paul Scholes, the, uh, and a mixture of Paul Scholes and Juan Sebastian Verón. Paul Scholes was superb at Manchester right. United. I'll take your word for it. 20 years, okay. 13 league titles. Yeah. Juan Sebastian Verón was less successful. But anyway, um, it's quite a comparison to compare it to Scholes. So he's only had three games. There's a long way to go before he matches Scholes' 600. But Where's he from? He is from Portugal. Right. And he, looked, he did look good. So it's early days, but Old Trafford love him and they need a bit of excitement. How much is he worth? He, they paid 65 for him, I think, around that figure. So 65, 65 million. Mil. So a lot of money. And I think there's add-ons for that. That can rise. But um, uh, they'll be pleased with their investment so far. More money than sense. Um, Deputy Sports Editor Matt Gatwood. <laughs> now, if you want to get in touch, email me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk. You follow us at mailplus. Now, new research suggests the world's oldest woman, it may have all have been a fraud. Researchers claim that Jeanne or Jeanne Calment from France did not in fact die at the age of 122 and 164 days in 1997. It was somebody else. Joining me to reveal all is Dr. Philip Gibbs, co-author of the research. Dr. Gibbs, I remember reading about this extraordinary woman in the 90s who went to this remarkable age. She met all these incredibly famous people, didn't she? Uh, but was it all a con? Right. Yes, yeah, she was. She saw the Eiffel Tower being built. She met at Vincent van Gogh, ugly like a louse. She roller skated, hunted wild boar, smoked, took up fencing in her 80s. All a con? Um, well, there are some inconsistencies in those stories, particularly the one about uh, meeting Van Gogh, because she said that she was introduced to, to Van Gogh by her husband, and it turns out uh, that um, she was only 13 at the time, so... Oh. Uh, she, you know, that an it illegal, couldn't an illegal have been quite marriage. As she said, yeah. And of course, there was also <laughs> yeah. a, a problem about her eyes. Apparently, Jean, her eyes were documented as one colour in the 30s, but on an identity card much later, they were green when they were a different colour in the 30s. Now, can eyes change colour? Um, actually, eyes can change colour when, as you get older. I mean, they, they, um, just as your hair can go grey, your your eyes can can lighten as it loses its, uh, you know, its, its tint. So, so that can happen. But, you know, it, it was th what uh, Nikolai Zapp presented were a number of arguments like this. Each one had uh, some plausibility, but it, was, it wasn't conclusive. There was always some reason that you could say, well, maybe, maybe that wasn't quite right. Maybe her eyes changed colour or something like this. Now, she, so it, it, yeah, she was fated, revered, interviewed again and again about the secrets of her youthful skin, her unrivaled longevity. But this research says that the woman who died in 1997 was her daughter, that mum had died years earlier. And this is all a ruse to avoid inheritance tax. Astonishing. Yeah, it's, it's a remarkable story. And certainly that's what I thought when I first read it. I, I thought that... You know, okay, there, there's a there's a good case being made here, but how could that possibly have happened? And I felt that uh, if it was true, there had to be something more behind it than than what we knew, because you you can't just change overnight. And somebody is not going to sacrifice their whole identity. Just, I mean, we hate paying taxes, but you know, that's that's quite extreme. It's so, an, I mean, in France, this has gone down very badly, of course, because she is, of course, revered as like a national heroine because she was easily the world's oldest woman. Uh, are people questioning the validity of the research? Um, they certainly are questioning it, yeah. And there's there's been, um, there's been a, a Facebook group which has been trying to find evidence to support her case. But at the same time, the the evidence that's coming out has been giving us a picture of what actually might have happened. Uh, we discovered, in, in fact, it's been revealed that uh, the family was stricken by tuberculosis, for, and this was a story that went back several years 
before the, the daughter is supposed to have died. Uh, and in fact, we believe that both the daughter and the mother had tuberculosis. And uh, it was in trying to cover this up that uh, they were eventually led to a situation where they uh, exchanged identities. In fascinating, isn't it? Because, I mean, them, they, she always seemed bizarrely youthful, didn't she? Even at 90, she was slim, fit. When she was 100, she was still cycling everywhere, smartly cut suits, heeled shoes. Uh, she was still climbing on tables at 110. That's right. Um, it, she, she was quite remarkable, and, and she kept a, a clear mind and, and uh, was making witticisms right up to um, the... the just a year or two before her her death, so uh, she she was remarkable physically, and it's it's a question that's really of very interest to to science as to how this could be. So it's it's actually quite important to know whether she was genuine yeah, or not. Because absolutely. Will we ever know definitively? Um, it, th there's a DNA test that can be done. Ah which would tell us this, but um, it's very hard to get them to do this DNA test. It turns out that France has some of the most strictest regulations in the world on doing DNA testing. Uh, so in France, you're not allowed to test your own DNA, for example, let alone somebody else's. So they have to make a very good case to get this test done. But if they do it, it would it would tell us yes well, or no whether she, she was genuine or not. Well, I hope they can do it. Thank you for joining me. That's Dr Philip Gabbs, co-author of the research. Now, the make-do and men mentality is returning, apparently, because we're becoming very environmentally conscious, so shoppers are turning away from fast fashion. So some brands are now offering free repairs and alterations so customers can wear items again rather than bin them. Others are now having workshops on how to sew and patch clothes, which have been worn only a few times. Now, the TV presenter, Kirsty Allsop, she told the Sunday Times the number one reason for clothes to end up in a landfill, in landfill and 350,000 items a year do, is because they're missing a button. She wants schools to teach pupils to replace a button and to use a sewing machine. Joining me now, I'm delighted to say, is a man who knows a thing or two about sewing machines, let alone signing on buttons. It's the celebrated fashion designer, David Emmanuel, designer to the stars, who, of course, designed Princess Diana's fabulous wedding dress. David, I'm not very good at sewing on buttons, so am I part of the problem? That's shocking. Andrew, how can you be? I Come used, on, you've got I, to be able to look after yourself Well, now. when I was a cub, I learned, yes. to, I learned to sew, but my eyesight's so bad now, I can't thread oh the, the cotton through the, through the eye of the needle. Glasses, glasses or contacts? Oh, dear, <laughs> oh, dear. So, so, I mean, no, it, it, actually, yeah. we, were, we were of a generation where we, we at Cubs and Scouts, we, we looked after ourselves and we yeah. were taught. You had your badge, didn't you? Yeah. But, I mean, I completely and utterly agree with, with, with Kirsty. I think what she said is it, 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 true. I mean, look, if you think of right now today, if I were to go into Windsor, where I live, if you went to a dry cleaners and you wanted the hems of your trousers, let's say, or jeans uh, hemmed up, yeah. 12, 12 or 15 pounds. Is it really? If you want a button put on, on anything, a jacket or a pair of trousers, five pounds. If you want a new zip, let's say you want a new zip in your jeans or wherever, or a jacket, 20 pounds. So I think, Andrew, when it hits the pocket, yes. people, hang on, hang on, people better take it, you know, deal with it um and there's nothing wrong you, you know i mean uh, we're going back uh, quite a few years when i was at school boys automatically did woodwork or metalwork girls did cookery and type in hang on surely those days have gone why can't we be good at everything at good at basic skills I'm, right yeah i can remember when i told my t teach head teacher i did not want to do woodwork i wanted to do domestic science i was yeah. given the belt just for the Absolutely. temerity of the suggestion. And we, were, we, and we were positively forced to go into, into woodwork or metalwork. And if you think that, it's ironic. If you think of the top chefs, they're all men. Yeah, that's right? very that's very true. It's very true. But, I mean, look, I would battle on with a sewing on a button, but I think it's very tricky to expect people to be able to sew in a zip. Yeah, zip, zips are tricky. And, OK, if you've got to give on give in, well, then give in on zips. because They, they are tricky. To, and I'm not I'm saying that every guy should be able to master a sewing machine but you can you should be able to look after yourself i mean the problem is we're living in in an age of fast 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 
fashion, mm. which is cheap and throw away. You know, you wear it once or twice, wear it, wear it at the weekend at dance and throw it. Now the new buzzword is sustainability. Clever word. Yeah. And may, may it long last. But basically what we're talking about here also, not that it's throwing away clothes, is quality. Generally, Andrew, if you buy a quality item, it will and should last if you look after it. Yes, quite. Now, when you did you me? last sew on a button? I did not just the other day, actually. Was it for you or was it for somebody else? No, it was for myself. Right. It needed attention. Should, should I say possibly a few pounds have crept in? And oh, I, think, I don't on. believe that, David. Oh, yes. Now, okay, it happens to all of us and, occasionally. And do you so have a... So, honestly, you know, bring out needle and thread. Um, yeah. And, and, and double double thread your, your cotton because you might need it. Yes. And and, and so away. And it's 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 basic skills. But the I keep on harping about it with kids today when they're at school, basic skills across the board. Like you should be uh, when you get to, to to sixth grade or whatever what they call you know senior school should be who teaches you how to open a bank account? Who teaches you? You know, all these basic things that one we take for granted that should be able to do. I know. Really. Well, now, I want to know, do you have a sewing machine at home or only in your like workshop? One does. Oh, one do does. You? And how often are you... Um, They're on... very cagey, but I, I, I am from the old school. When I trained as a, as a designer, not only did we have to cut patterns and, and, and drape and machine your, your gowns, so, yeah, I, but, but there's an awful lot of men out there across the country who've never seen a sewing machine. So I wouldn't put that upon them. But, I mean, there's usually a little lady around the corner who does, like a dressmaker who does repairs and that sort of thing. But you will have quite a shock if you went to your local dry cleaners and ask them, seriously, to do a hem or a button. It's expensive. I'm, not, I'm going to ask them to when, I, when I next go in there. Can I just ask you finally, David, you have w became internationally famous around the world when you did Diana's wedding dress. The yes. most recent royal wedding, I don't know how long it's going to last, that marriage, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. What did you think of her dress? I thought it was um, simple, elegant. My criticism, Andrew, about that was, unfortunately, if you look at the bridal tradition of British brides, Royal brides, they've been British. I mean, she went to a French house, Givenchy. Yes, I'm know. sorry, not good enough. We've got plenty of wonderful young designers here who could have done it. And I think it was right. very simple, but the only talk and the point about her, her gown was the veil was very beautiful, embroidered with all the Commonwealth uh, motifs around the veil. It was lovely, very simple, elegant, but disappointing. It should have been British. I think so. Why wasn't it you? Well, I wasn't asked. <laughs> oh, that's a very good reason. <laughs> David, thank you for joining me. That's David Emmanuel, fashion designer to the stars, designer of Princess Diana's wedding dress, and makes a very good point about Meghan Markle's frock. <laughs> Finally, I'm talking to the girls here. Would you spend thousands proposing to your man this leap year? Because on Saturday, more women than ever will get down on one knee, apparently, many enlisting the help of a new kind of fixer, the proposal planner. Now, to help me out with this story is marriage proposal expert Daisy Amodio. Now, Daisy, um, what is the evidence that more women will propose this weekend? I think everything in this day and age is changing. So women can do whatever they want these days and there yeah. shouldn't be any reason why they shouldn't do it. And we shouldn't just do it on leap year as well because it's only every four years. Um, but as a proposal planner, 99% of our clients are actually men. Um, are they and really? still, yeah. Yeah. And it's still quite sad, actually, that 99 percent of men and, and we do get phone calls from women quite often, actually. Um, but they just get nervous and they back out. Um, so we've only actually ever had um, six women to to men propose. Is that and we've so? had 1700. Wow. Now, what yeah. sort of prop what give me a typical proposal what, what, that you would plan? What would it be? How would it take take hmm. place? What would they so do? They all so they all vary in price, um, but mainly people want to spend between two thousand and five thousand pounds, and for that they would have something at an iconic destination. So for this instance, maybe the Shard, the Shangri La is a five star hotel. They could have a private private dining space. We could decorate it with balloons, petals, candles, flowers. They could have a harpy serenading them, and a photographer and a videographer. And it's completely private and just about them. And that's kind of what people want these days. And how often, when they've spent all that money, Daisy, does the woman say, nah, not interested? <laughs> Do you know, people love that question. Honestly, out of 1,700, no one has ever, ever said really? no. Really? 
no, honestly, and I know it's going to happen one day, and I, I just don't want to see it because these guys come to us and they just want to make something more personalised, a bigger story than yeah. perhaps what they could have done themselves. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll happen one day, but so far, a good now, success rate. are you married, Daisy? I am, yeah. How was your proposal? Was he romantic? Well, I mean, how do you propose to a proposal plan? Yeah, at the difficult. Time, I, <laughs> I was the only one in the world to do this at the time, and I was desperate to get engaged. I mean, I I, I should have proposed, um, but I, you know, I felt a bit nervous to be honest with you, and I didn't because of tradition. Yeah. Um, so he made me wait about seven years. Ah, oh, um, <laughs> seven year itch. <laughs> yeah, and then he finally did it, probably because I said I was going to leave if he didn't do it. And did but he go down he, on bended knee? He did. He did. We we bought our first flat in London. I was quite proud of that. And he tricked me. And when I got back, um, all all the petals and candles were out, and there was a big sign on the roof oh. terrace door that said, "Is this how you pictured your future?" And I went out there, and he was fully suited with lanterns and candles, and it was just about us. And yeah, how lovely. romantic is that? <laughs> it's, it's good. And you're still happy. <laughs> Still happy, yeah. Very good. That's Daisy Amodio. She is a marriage proposal uh, uh, expert. So uh, you can spend between two and a half to five thousand pounds, and um, the most expensive one she's ever organised cost eight hundred thousand pounds. Wasn't mine. That's all we've got time for today. For the latest from the Daily Mail newsroom, come back every day for briefings at seven a.m., twelve noon, and of course five p.m. Where you can listen to me all over again. That's all from me, Andrew Pierce from the Daily Show. I'll be back tomorrow. Have yourselves a great evening and good night. Thank you.